In today's video, we're going to be looking at cooling curves and heating curves. We'll interpret them and gather what information we can from them. We'll also talk a little bit about just general strategies for creating a good graph, whether it's by hand or on a computer. So to begin with a cooling curve, here we have one for an unknown liquid. We started with a hot liquid in a test tube. A thermometer or a temperature sensor was placed into the liquid and we allowed it to cool down. Now sometimes you would just let it cool down with the test tube in the open air. Sometimes you would put the test tube in a hot water bath, so a beaker with some hot water, and which would let it cool down more slowly than it would in the open air. So we're recording the temperature of the liquid, the hot liquid, as it cools every 30 seconds. Now you can see in, from the graph, you can imagine what the data table must have looked like. They began with zero minutes and they went all the way to 12 minutes. And you can tell that there's a data point every half minute or every 30 seconds. You can also tell from the graph that the hottest temperature the liquid began at was over at just under 75 degrees Celsius, about 74.6-ish it looks like and it cooled all the way down at the end at the 12 minute mark to just over 50 degrees, about 50.7 degrees. So other data table would have had times from zero to 12 and temperatures starting around 75 and cooling down to just around 50. Now just some basic graphing skills. If you were making this graph by hand, let's look at the different elements that make this a good graph. Number one, it has a very clear and descriptive title. So it doesn't just say temperature versus time. It has a, a, des a descriptive title that if you looked at that, you understand what this graph is going to be about. Cooling curve of an un unknown chemical. The axes, the x-axis on the bottom and the y-axis on the side, they're clearly labeled. They have time and temperature, but they also have units. The times are measured in minutes and the temperature was measured in degrees Celsius. Next, we look at the scale. Choosing a scale, especially when you're graphing by hand, is one of the harder things. Because in the end, what you want is a scale which is large. So in other words, the graph takes up a large part of your graph paper. Um, you don't want a graph that fills just maybe half the graph paper or one third of the graph paper. You'd like a graph that fills up most of the graph paper. So a large graph is what you're aiming for. But you also want a scale which is easy to read because somebody's going to want to read the temperatures and read the times. You're going to want to read them when you plot your points. So this person chose on their time scale to go from 0 to 12. They're going up by one minute. That's a very simple scale to use. Um, their temperatures, since their lowest temperature was just a little bit over 50 degrees, they chose to start the temperature axis at 50 and then the, their highest temperature was just under 75. They chose to go all the way up to 80, which is fair. Um, still, it's a little bit more than they needed, but that's a nice number to end at, 50 to 80. Those are nice whole numbers. And their values there, their major scale goes up by 5 degrees, which is convenient, simple to read. So choosing your scales so that they're easy to read, easy to plot points with, but they take up a lot of your graph paper. Those are what you're aiming for. Okay. All right, so let's take a look at this graph. So the temperature started off hot. Temperature, the thermometer was in a liquid in a test tube, and it cooled down. And you'll notice that at, after a certain point, it plateaued. The temperature stayed almost constant in this region here. Ideally, it would have stayed perfectly constant, but here you have a small little uh, slope to that, but, but very small. Now that point of the graph is very important. So we, be, we began with hot liquid over here, and as it cooled, it eventually froze. Where you see that plateau, that is where we have freezing. And so since it's freezing, in the test tube at that point, you'd have both solid and liquid present in the test tube. At, at the beginning, it would have been almost pure liquid, and by the end of that plateau, it would be solid, pure solid. And at the end, when the plateau finishes, the temperature continues to drop, at that point you have just solid in the test tube. And it's going to continue to cool down until it reaches room temperature, but the experiment stopped at 12 minutes and the temperature was still 
around 50 degrees. Now something funny is happening just before the plateau. You notice that there's a bit of a dip in the graph, the, right in this region here. The temperature actually dropped below the temperature on that plateau, and then it warmed back up. That's a very important part of this graph. Not all cooling curves demonstrate this, but I'm going to draw a little dotted line up that goes through the lowest part of that dip. At that point that I've just drawn, this is where freezing begins. Okay, right here, the freezing begins. And this point over here at the end of the plateau where the temperature starts to fall again, this is where freezing ends. Now, that dip before the plateau, we have there a liquid, so we began with liquid, but it remained liquid even though the temperature dipped below the temperature where it should have frozen. That's called supercooling. So that part of the graph, that dip, is where supercooling is occurring. Supercooling it refers to a liquid that remains a liquid even though its temperature is below its freezing point. So it should be freezing, but it hasn't yet. So it's, it's a liquid that is colder than its freezing point. Water freezes at zero degrees Celsius. If you had some liquid water at minus five degrees Celsius, then that water would be super cooled. It's cooled below the freezing point. It's highly unstable and it will begin to freeze. And when it does, the temperature warms back up. So when you see on the graph, the temperature warms up to that plateau. All right. Now, if you look at the plateau, I'm going to draw a dotted line. I'm going to use a ruler to do this if I was doing this on my printed graph or graph by hand. But I'm going to draw a, a line that is, that is um, parallel to or tangent to that plateau. And then whatever temperature that line hits on the y-axis, that will be the freezing point. So in this case, the freezing point, I'll highlight it here, is where that line I just drew, which was parallel to the plateau where it was freezing, that shows a freezing point of approximately, I'll just put FP for freezing point, it'd be a bit, bit between 64 and 65, a little closer to 65, so I'll say it's approximately 64.08 degrees Celsius. You might say 64.7, 64.8 degrees Celsius is the freezing point um, of, the, of the liquid. All right, so this is an interpretation of a cooling curve. You're going to be given some data, either data on a handout or data that you watch in a video, and you're going to have to create your own cooling curve like this. You'll label it like I've done here. Um, you may or may not see supercooling in your cooling curve, so if there isn't evidence of supercooling, if you don't see a little dip like that before the plateau, then you just leave that out. If there is that dip before the plateau, you'll label it as supercooling. Uh, you'll draw these dotted lines that I did. You'll label your curves liquid and solid and solid and liquid. You'll label freezing, and you'll label the freezing point of your liquid as well. Next, we have a heating curve. And again, look at the graph, just the elements of a good graph. There is a very clear descriptive title. The axes are labeled, and they have their units as well. The scales fill up the graph paper, and they're easy to read, 0, 1 to, to 10 minutes, going up by 1s. And the temperature scale, and the lowest temperature was a little bit below 20, so they chose to start at 10, a nice round number. Their highest temperature was up at just below 80. They could have stopped at 80, but that would have meant that the graph would have hit the very, very top of the graph paper. So they went all the way up to 90 degrees Celsius, which was fair. It's probably a better choice. So there's their, the scale goes up by 10 degrees Celsius as well, which is easy to read. Now, this time you had a liquid which was at room temperature. The temperature starts off at just around 20 degrees, about 18 degrees Celsius. And they were heating the liquid either on a hot plate or with a Bunsen burner, um, probably in a flask. Now, the liquid as it heats is going to produce more and more vapor, and that vapor um, sometimes can be allowed to go into the air if it's not flammable, 
or sometimes if it is a flammable vapor or flammable liquid that you're heating, the vapor will be passed through a hose and allowed to condense in a cold water bath nearby. You'll see, you'll see that in a video, in a, in a separate video. So this person is measuring the temperature as the liquid heats up every 30 seconds again, every half minute. And now see if you can understand the similar analysis that we saw in our last graph. So we see a plateau where the temperature stops changing um, since we began here with a liquid. We were told that up above. We're heating it. Then the liquid is eventually going to boil. So over here we have boiling occurring at that plateau. Um, and when it's boiling, the liquid is being converted into vapor or gas. So you have liquid and vapor, or you could say liquid and gas. The plateau begins right around here. You might argue a little bit with that, but I'll say about there's where the plateau began. So liquid up to that dotted line, and then it begins to boil on the plateau after that dotted line. They did not allow it to completely boil away, which is why the temperature doesn't rise at the end of the plateau. If the liquid were allowed to completely boil away, so there's no more liquid left, then the temperature inside the container would rise after that. But here, they did a good idea from a safety perspective is to never allow the liquid to boil completely dry because your container, your flask, your test tube could break if you're heating an empty container. So we always stop heating before it's uh, completely boiled away. Um, the boiling point of the liquid, so I'm gonna do what I did before. I'm gonna take the plateau, use a ruler if I were doing this with a piece of graph paper. I'm gonna draw a straight line that is parallel to that curve, to the plateau rather, and let it draw it all the way over to the y-axis. And looking at that, uh, where it hits the y-axis, the temperature there is more than 78, but less than 80. I'm going to estimate that the boiling point, I'll say BP for boiling point, is approximately 79 degrees Celsius. Right? With that scale, each of the minor tick marks is 2 degrees. Um, I'll just say that's around 79 degrees Celsius, the boiling point of the liquid. So you're going to, again, be given some data on a worksheet where you'll make your own heating curve like this and label it like I've done here. Or you'll be watching a video where we do heating a heating curve and you'll collect data while you watch the video that's on YouTube. One of those two options um, to make your own 